right, so I'm here with Laura, and first of all, we got this amazing grant from Pfizer. So we are just like so grateful to Pfizer, not only just like for believing in us, but really just giving us the chance to really expand what we do. Um, it's very hard nowadays as a nonprofit or any business really to to maintain what they do, and we're just we feel really lucky. So. The research infrastructure program, which is what was funded, is going to allow us to actually build a system to evaluate our programs, starting from, from soup to nuts, really, just identifying what metrics we should be using even to do something like that, for example, for an education program or for our naloxone distribution program, and then being able to actually de determine what the impact is for clients, for the community, for professionals, and for us. What are we doing well? What, what should we change? Um, to really make the best impact that we can in this community um, in, in Illinois. Um, and then with that, hopefully being able to actually spread that across the country and teach other communities and other nonprofit organizations how to do what we do and customize it so that, you know, a small town in rural Georgia can institute what we're doing based on what their needs are and their demographics. Um, so we're really excited about this opportunity, and we will be updating you all throughout the year next year on, um, on where we're at. So, yeah. And this is so very important because just within the last few days, the CDC released new data. And that new data shows that we have gone from 129 overdose deaths a day to 144. That's 52,000 people dead this year from overdose. So why is that? Uh, naloxone is much more accessible. Many police are carrying it. Lay people can get it. You can get it without a prescription. Uh, treatment access is easier to come by. So why do those numbers keep going up? We have many theories about that. Uh, the first one I think of, because I work with these people day in, day out, and I see the shame and the stigma. I don't think we have come even close to getting rid of the shame and stigma that these people with addictions feel, that their families feel. They don't want to talk about this. They don't want to reach out. And silence kills. Absolutely. And, and it's, you know, it's an illness. And, you know, we've come to the realization that people have been using drugs for thousands of years. So how can we now in 2016 still be on this theory, this concept that this, that using drugs and the propensity for addictions and the fact that the brain is wired to have dependency on things and to, and ha and to become addicted to things, not just drugs, food, sex, gambling, whatever, pick your poison, um, that's a human that's a human thing mm -hmm. and we still have not just grasped that it's okay to be human so denial and shame for sure I would say um, and other theories that we have are you know just just really specifically lack of harm reduction among treatment services is probably very profound for us I mean you have thousands and thousands of treatment centers across the country and 30 years ago the abstinence-based approach was the approach abstinence-based meaning that if you are addicted to drugs or alcohol that using Nothing, not even medication for depression or whatever you're utilizing would even be a part of that. There are so many centers that still do that. And I, I wonder with opioid use disorder, why that's effective. Because we know that medication-assisted treatments to block cravings, we know that counseling support, and we know that recovery support in tandem work together. I think that if you're a treatment center or if you're thinking about sending yourself or someone you love to a treatment center, if they aren't practicing harm reduction, you should really ask yourself, is this the place for me? You should be asking them questions like, will, will I be allowed to be prescribed medications? Will be I, I be hooked up with a, a PA or a nurse practitioner or an addictionologist? Is somebody going to be able to help me medically, biologically, psychologically, and socially with everything that I need? If they can't say yes to all three of those, I would... Highly consider looking for another facility. Mm -hmm. um, people are leaving treatment and they're going back out and they're using and they're ODA. That is the, that is the trend. That is what we still see, even though we know that MAT is available, even though you know treatment centers across the country are being encouraged to use these evidence-based practices. They're just not doing it. I don't understand um, why that is. So another theory that we have is you know availability of heroin, availability of illegal lab-made prescription pills, synthetic drugs, and fentanyl is really causing a massive problem. 
we say everything in moderation, right? The availability of all these drugs, there's nothing, nothing good about that. Um, the fact that anybody can go out at any time and access anything, not knowing really what they're getting. I mean, you're talking about fentanyl. You're talking about a drug that's a thousand, a hundred to a thousand times stronger than heroin. Mm -hmm. So if you're a heroin user, if you're an opioid user at all, if you love somebody who is, you really need to be expressing to your loved one that it's not about, um, it's not just about trying to to seek some sort of a healthier lifestyle. It's if you're going to go out and use again, why are you using the same amount as you used before? Is there a mechanism that you can use, like starting low and going slow? It's something we teach when we teach overdose prevention. Um, because yes, your dealer may pretend that they care about you, but they don't. They're just trying to make money and trying to live their lifestyle. And if they're giving you fentanyl, how are you going to know that until it's in your blood? How are you going to know that until you snort it up your nose? You're not going to know that. Just be careful. Fentanyl is rampant. If you think that you're invincible and that you can beat it, you can't. You just have to be smart. And um, I think that that's just something we have to say and establish because we're worried about people. We're seeing these OD numbers go up. It's frightening. Um, I would say the fact that Illinois is so broke <laughs> probably doesn't help my next no. point, which is that people who are indigent or are poor, frankly, can't get care. They, I, I'll just give you an example of a client that we experienced. We spent a whole week and a half with. She went to seven hospitals before she ended up in the psych ward. And before that, she was in a substance abuse primary facility. And when her primary disorder isn't substance abuse, it's mental illness. So the whole system was kind of flipped on its back and we didn't have the supportive services to be able to care for her. Um, she doesn't have a great insurance plan, so it wasn't really possible to send her to the center that I felt she could go to or that we assessed that she could go to. But just the fact that there are thousands and thousands of other people like her who have no insurance or very, very um, low coverage types of insurance plans, it's scary. It's so scary um, that there's just not enough services for them. Um, we know how to find those types of services, so if, if there is a need for that and you aren't a person who has a you know Blue Cross Blue Shield PPO insurance plan, for example, or a, another private plan, we can help find those services. But it's becoming slimmer and slimmer as the state goes more broke every day. So if you can call your legislators and ask them to ask them what's going on and really encourage them to to talk about getting a budget passed, that would be great. It would and make things easier for people. What about the people that don't have advocates like us or don't have involved family? Yeah. What happens to them? You know what? They become part of that statistic. And I don't care who you are, but every single life matters. No matter how poor you are, yep. your life matters. I think the other thing, too, is in just in doing this work with police for so long, um, if you live in a community that doesn't have police naloxone or fire naloxone programs with your EMTs and your fire departments, please call us and tell us where you are, and we will try and make the, the communication to those entities that they need to establish these programs. Who gets to the scene of an overdose faster than police or fire departments? No one. And if that person is... They, if those people do not have naloxone on them, they are 10 times more at risk of death. There's no excuse anymore. Police departments need to be focusing on enhancing their community relations. And one of the key ways to do that right now is through simple public health strategy, like getting naloxone into the hands of their officers and making sure that they're using it, and then making sure that they're referring out to treatment. Lake County has a great model. DuPage County has a great model. Communities across Illinois have great models just ind independently. I would suggest highly, highly trying to advocate in your own community for that. If, so I think that that's a huge factor as to why overdoses have gone up. Who's mm -hmm. saving those people? Mm -hmm. If there's no naloxone in the home, who's going to reverse those right. ODs? And this isn't coming from Live for Lolly. This came from the Surgeon General, who made a statement that all first responders should be carrying naloxone. So if your police department isn't carrying it, they work for you. Ask them why. Ask them where it is. Tell them you know where to get it, and then you call us. Yeah, I, I think it's so fascinating that, that people get scared about like, okay, well, what can I even do as a citizen? We pay tax dollars to our legislators, to our police departments, to our fire departments, mm -hmm. to our state's attorney's office, to our sheriff's department, to our county board. We need to be asking them to help us. So 
We can teach you how to do that. We're just a phone call or an email or a Facebook message away. And I would say, you know, the people, if you have long-term sobriety, congratulations. I, I think we all can say that that's such a huge feat to do, especially with, with mental illness and substance abuse in, in tow. That puts you more at risk for overdose. Not because your program's not strong. That's not what we're saying. Because the day that you may have an urge to use and the day that you do not work your program, whatever that is, whether it's refuge recovery, smart recovery, 12 step, maybe you have your own program that you do that's separate from traditional programs. Whatever that is, you are not invincible. If you go out and use again, your risk of death is so much higher than somebody else's. So if you are someone in recovery, if you love someone in recovery, if you are a friend of somebody in recovery, a coworker, whatever, check in on them, ask them how they're doing, ask them if they have naloxone, and if they don't, we can help you tell them how to access it. They can come here to our clinic, they can get it at Mariano's, they can get it at Walgreens. Um, you know, there's a lot of facilities and, and harm reduction agencies across the country that we can connect you with. No one is invincible. Everyone's life matters, um, especially during the holidays, especially during the holidays. When there's a lot of hurt and a lot of drama for so many people, you can't go without it. And I think, Laura, you also have said a lot, stay mindful, stay in the moment. We really want to encourage you to just stay present in who you are and, and what you do to stay alive and to stay healthy. Absolutely. You can only control yourself. Yes. And so, you know, we've had some great successes this year. The Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act passed. We finally appropriated the funding for it. The government is putting nine billion dollars into services, comprehensive services from prevention all the way down to overdose prevention and beyond um, for mental health and addiction. It's a huge victory and we are really looking forward to um, taking advantage of those programs. We're really looking forward to continue doing what we're doing um, and um, I think we just all want to express how grateful we are for each of you, how, how um, Humbled we are by our overwhelming amount of donors and support and volunteers and our partners. Um, and and just, just really thanking all of you for whether you have volunteered or whether you're just somebody who tunes in, we appreciate that you even are. Um, we want to encourage you all to take this information and go back to your families, go back to your communities and use it. We don't just do this because we want to waste 10 minutes of your day. Um, so we really hope that if you take anything from this, you will take that this is a message that you can spread and share. Um, so our holiday wishes for all of you guys to just stay safe, stay focused, and reach out if you need our help. Absolutely. Have a great and wonderful holiday. Thank you.